to the Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and we're delighted to see all of you here today. Our program today explores a challenging subject. For some, our program title, Pain, A Political History, may conflate pain and politics, so those persons are prompted to say, yeah, I get it. Politics today is painful. It is a pain. <laughs> but that's not actually where we're going. Rather, we'll be looking at the politics of pain and pain medicine. We'll examine how pain and its relief have been and continue to be defined and bedeviled by controversy in our society. And we'll see how the question, who is in pain and what relief do they deserve, is actually here in America a deeply political question, one that has become a microcosm of broad cultural and socio-political debates for many years now, up to the moment, debates over disability, citizenship, liberalism, and conservatism. Here to lead us on this expedition into Payne's contested political territory is Professor Keith Wei Lu, the Townsend Martin Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University, where he teaches in both the History Department and the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Professor Wei Lu is one of the foremost scholars working today at the intersection of history, medicine, race, and public policy. His books, and he has several, as you'll see in the short biographical sketch in your handout, offer intrepid and illuminating takes on tough issues in medicine and society, including cancer, sickle cell disease, genetics, and most recently, pain. And this is his most recent book, Pain, A Political History. We're very happy to welcome Professor Weilu back to UVA this time under the generous co-sponsorship of our History of the Health Sciences Lecture Series and the University-wide Institute for Practical Ethics and Public Life. In addition to the Medical Center Hour, Professor Wei Lu will offer a preview of his next project, a study of mentholated cigarettes in the context of public health and, and issues of race, gender, and targeted marketing. This more informal session will take place at 3 o'clock this afternoon in open grounds in the corner building on University Avenue, and everyone is welcome. Um, before uh, Keith Wei Lu takes, um, takes charge, I'd like to mention that he has no financial conflicts of interest with commercial concerns mentioned in his presentation. So welcome, Keith. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Childress, for the introduction, for the invitation, indeed, to attend and to participate in the Medical Center Hour. I'm assuming you can hear me okay out there. Um, so, uh, uh, bearing in mind that it is an hour, I'm going to uh, make two apologies. One is that uh, I'll be speaking fairly quickly to make sure there's time for some conversation uh, in the last 10 minutes or so, or 15 minutes. And then secondly, that I do have a, a nagging cough that might flare up sometime during my conversation to our discussion today. Um, hopefully not, but uh, there's a lot of medical assistance out here, I assume. Um, so the, the question that really drew me to this book uh, years ago when I began it is something that I suspect is familiar to you all today as healthcare practitioners, as people who are interested in health, and as people who are grappling with the most recent manifestations in the pain controversy, that is the use and misuse and the problem of opioids, uh, opiates in uh, American healthcare, but also in society. It's a question that I assume that would be central to any history of pain, and it's captured by this New Yorker cartoon from 2000. Uh, why is the problem of pain so controversial, and why has it been controversial for so long? Some of the most obvious places to start is what this doctor says, standing over the patient's bedside, the wife also. We can give you enough medication to alleviate the, the pain, but not enough to make it fun. And the question of where does pain alleviation end and pleasure making, fun making begin, is something that we all grapple with both individually, uh, it varies by individual, but it's also a matter of profound healthcare policy, medical practice, and public policy. If this was the only controversy in the politics of pain, it would be a fairly short book to kind of track how this evolved. But it turns out that there are underlying questions, 
questions that opiates and narcotic medication only begin to touch on. Uh, the most important one is the question of measurability, reliability of measurement. Um, pain is necessarily subjective, experts depend on individual patients, and a variety of what you might call secondary indices, blood pressure, respiration, uh, but it's not to understand pain as it's experienced by an individual. But it's not truly, despite the fact that the American Pain Society calls it the fifth vital sign, it is not a vital sign in healthcare in the same way that temperature and blood pressure are. So it raised the fundamental question about whether I can understand your experience or what your professed experience is. It bedevils the question of who's in pain and how much relief is deserved. Of course, there's the issue of drugs and drug dependence, fear of dependence, fear of addiction to opiates and other medications which is acknowledged to be highly individualized and varying by individual and also by context. We'll get to that in a minute. There's another underlying cultural problem in the question of pain, which you see as the, the question of when is pain legitimate and when is it illegitimate? When is it believable and credible and when it is not? Um, and then there are also, you might say, shadowy problems, really perplexing, blurry problems in the history of pain. Some of them flare up in the course of the 1990s as we enter an era where the debate revolves around, the medical and health policy debate begins to revolve around end-of-life care um, and end-of-life medicine and physician-assisted suicide. One of the questions that emerges in that context is, when is end-of-life compassionate pain medicine the best example of compassion, and, to, and when does it blur over, given the fact that morphine suppresses blood pressure and, induce, and, and inhibits respiration, provides relief, when does it begun, begin to look like hastening death? Where is the line between compassionate care and physician-assisted suicide? So you can see that what looked like one blurry problem, the line between pain and pleasure, can also be the blurry problem between physician-assisted suicide and compassionate care of the end of life. And then I'll add another controversy to the mix. When is pain truly disabling? Now this is the issue that I was really surprised to discover as central to the pain debate going well back into the 1950s. And who is to judge whether your pain is truly disabling pain and what's the right way to behave as someone who is suffering with chronic pain? How should a patient in chronic pain behave? Is it best? What is, you know, all of these sort of moralistic and cultural standards are applied to this question. Should we be stoic? Should we just get up from the bed and press on? What degree of compassion and um, kind of uh, depend dependence is allowable? Uh, who should be seeking relief? And whose complaints matter? All of these, what seem to be discrete problems in the problem of who is in pain and how relief should be organized, I first began, became acquainted with when I was doing a book on the history of sickle cell disease. Uh, sickle cell disease associated with African Americans, uh, associated with infection, higher rates of infection, early mortality, but also what, are, what were called in the 1960s until today these recurrent painful crises. And as I was doing that book, which came out in the early part, just it sort of segues into this pain book, what I discovered is that here's a disease that's characterized and rising to prominence in the 1960s as a new, it's not new, but it's newly vis vis visible, it's newly prominent, uh, a disease of pain and suffering among African Americans that had gone too long ignored. You can see how attention to sickle cell disease in the 60s echoed and resonated with the political and cultural currents of the time period. The idea of being compassionate to a young person with sickle cell disease was in part part of the cultural and political moment of this era. By the time, and so, but even there, as I was doing this research, which focused on Memphis, Tennessee, I encountered researchers like Lemuel Diggs, who's the centerpiece of the story, who worried. He worried about the fact that in Memphis, in the heart of the Mid South, surrounded by rural counties in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee, conservative, not just politically but also culturally, he worried that. The people in Oakland and Chicago thought that in Memphis they tended to undertreat sickle cell pain, whereas from the perspective of Memphis, they tended to think that people in Oakland, that is practitioners in Oakland and Chicago, tended to overtreat. What I, what I became aware of is the fact that how we deal with pain is also layered upon 
a lot of these cultural, where we happen to live, and the cultural dynamics surrounding healthcare in Charlottesville, in Memphis, in Oakland, in Chicago, in New York. And that this changes with time. So that by the 1990s, what confront, what found in the record, in the historical record, but also in the public conversation, increasing patients with sickle cell disease who found that they had to navigate in the ER setting skepticism. Skepticism, frustration by nurses, by ER workers about whether this was somebody who was truly in the extent of pain that they professed to be in, or whether they were perhaps faking pain, they were drug seekers, um, and they were out to get some sort of secondary benefit from professing to be in pain. As one observer, one patient said, before you can get past the agony, you have to convince a doctor that it's real. This is to say that, therefore, pain comes in multiple forms. It comes in, uh, in each time period, in each context, it is understood differently. And so delving into trying to write the history of pain as a political problem was going to be a, a really complex undertaking. What I want to do is to, um, to kind of take you very quickly through what that history looked like and to arrive at what it means to say that this is a political history and to kind of end by talking about surprising findings. The fact that it's not just what started off as a clinical story and perhaps a scientific story became a political story and then ultimately, I arrived uh, in writing this book in court. That is to say, I realized that many of these debates about who's in pain and how much relief they deserve ended up being surprisingly a legal story. And I want to explain what I mean by that in a moment. Quickly, what I'll do is I'll describe to you the post-World War II era, the birth of pain medicine, in which physicians begin to grapple with these controversies. Is pain real? If so, what should be done about it? Whether surgeons should be at the leading edge of pain relief for the chronically ill, for the terminally ill, whether drug innovation was a good thing or ultimately a bad thing, and what role psychiatry should play. I want to take you through the 1960s that sees a fantastic and fabulous proliferation of approaches to pain and validation of pain as a legitimate area of medical practice, the birth of palliative medicine as we know it, uh, driven by new theories about pain, the gait control theory of pain, and a multiplicity of approaches from acupuncture to patient controlled analgesia, etc. And then I want to talk a little bit about the backlash that emerges in the 1980s, driven by anxiety. Anxiety not just about the growth of pain medicine as a field, but about disability, and a society that grown too welcoming, perhaps too compassionate, perhaps a compassion that could not be afforded. And I'll take you through that by looking specifically at anxieties about disability access, this, to what extent chronic pain should be considered a true disability. The, the, understory, the underpinning of this story is a debate that's going on in society from the 50s and 60s through the 70s and 80s about what kind of society we want. And that broad debate about liberalism and conservatism in society, what I want to argue is it, it filters down into the kinds of decisions that disability examiners are making, and it filters down into the kinds of decisions that judges are making, and it also filters, also filters down into the kinds of decisions that practitioners make about who's in pain and what kind of relief they deserve. And ultimately, the book is about pain reform today and the challenges we confront. A main character in both my talk and the story is this gentleman, John Bonica, who in the 1970s is regarded as the father of pain medicine. But he comes to pain medicine as a World War II physician, but he ultimately in the 60s puts into place a new model of pain, uh, the multidisciplinary pain clinic, uh, the idea being that neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, and other medical colleagues are involved in pain care. It's, no, it's not just a one-dimensional problem. It needs multiple perspectives. He's the author of one of the first sort of clinical management uh, textbooks on pain, The Management of Pain, which became later known as a Bible for the field. He's appointed as the chair of anesthesiology at University of Washington in 1961 and organizes a multidisciplinary pain clinic. And you might say his career both helps to shape and reflects the emergence of pain medicine as a field. By 1973, 
He organized the first international symposium on pain in Seattle, and which leads to the founding of the IASP, uh, launches a new journal of pain. By then, he's known as the father of pain medicine. And over the next 20 years, he becomes a true leader in the field. Uh, his center regarded as a national model for patient care and teaching. He becomes a policy advisor and a really important figure in the emergence of this field. When he enters medicine uh, after World War II and he decides to devote himself to the study of pain, he is confronted by a medical world that is unsure of what to do particularly about people in chronic pain. As one Boston psychiatrist noted, we don't know whether to treat these complaints seriously or not. We're not sure we have the right models for dealing with them in medicine. The relief of pain is obviously one of the main functions of the physician, says this psychiatrist. Ironically, it's one of the things we do least well, partly because we don't understand it. Less forgiving, um, less uh, forgiving of the complainant was Henry Albronda, a Los Angeles-based psychiatrist, who at a California pain symposium in 1959 said that patients in pain were, chronic pain were worthy of study, but not necessarily worthy of sympathy. That we should be careful about giving quick sympathy to the person who complains of chronic pain. Why? Because there's a psychiatric model of maladjustment that underpins anxieties about the person in chronic pain. He says complaints about chronic pain <coughs> may develop in the child, brought up to repress feelings of hatred, who then may use those complaints of pain to cover his hostile feelings towards an associate. Malingering, the idea that a malingerer would profess to be in pain in order to gain, to get, to derive secondary benefits from that complaint. Masochistic self-punishment underlies the chronic painful condition. Pain was not something to be taken at face value, it was something to be looked at skeptically and critically. And to indulge people in pain by giving them access to fast relief for these kinds of physicians was the worst thing that one could do. Now these anxieties about malingering and deception have not entirely disappeared from medicine. Uh, they're still really important issues. But in this time period, this concern about the chronic pain patient as somebody who was playing sick, who wasn't really ill, and for whom indulgence could become a long-term social problem. These were foremost in the minds of people like Henry Albronda. Why was he so concerned about the legitimacy of people in chronic pain? Well, he's writing in a context in which social policy is changing. In 1956, the year before he said those words, in California, but also in, uh, in Washington, D.C., this gentleman, the President Eisenhower, had signed into law a new disability benefit in Social Security. You might say there's a public sector debate about pain and pain relief at this time that looks like this, an at where increasingly physicians are asked the question, who is really chronically disabled? What evidence is needed to establish compensable disability? This is a new program that's developed, and there's a politics for how it's developed and why it's developed, in some ways a very shrewd uh, Senate Majority Leader named Lyndon Baines Johnson in the lead up to the 1956 elections uh, really boxes Eisenhower in and Eisenhower is running for re-election himself disabled after suffering a heart attack and he has to decide whether to sign this liberal health policy in, in order to somebody ensure his re-election or whether to go along with um, on the one hand uh, the, the AMA which is fiercely opposed to this kind of new development well, what this new, the creation of a disability benefit in Social Security does is it draws people towards the federal government, like Rosie Page, a Texas housewife who had extraordinary arthritis with which her physician said was marked with, had a marked psychogenic overlay. That is, the blurry line between physical disability and mental disability. Is this a psychiatric problem or is it a physical problem? Um, she was a denied benefits like many. She would take those, her, she, would, she would appeal that case both to H, the Health and Education and Welfare Department and once again she was rejected and ultimately what's the recourse for such people? It's into the federal appellate courts. So this is what I mean by the fact that from the inception the question of who's in pain and how much relief they deserve and what's the proper evidence for determining disability 
becomes not a political issue, it becomes a legal concern, and it's the courts that have to decide. This is what is in Henry Albronda's mind as he is weighing the question of whether people in chronic pain are legitimate claimants. The question of opening the doors to relief comes before the courts, and in fact, Rosie Page, the case of Page v. Celebrezzi, is a landmark case in society in 1963 that you can see it opens the doors to a liberal era of relief. It's actually, the majority opinion is, is written by this gentleman, John R. Brown. He's a Republican, and he's an Eisenhower appointee, but he's also liberal on a number of social policy issues. He believes that, you know, Everyone should be their brother's keeper, but not everybody had a right to be kept. It was an era of, you might say, moderation, moderate republicanism that was shaping and reshaping social policy. And in his landmark ruling in the Page v. Celebrezzi case, he wrote the following words about subjective pain. If pain is real to the patient, the disability entitles the person to the statutory benefits. The fact that pain complained of by claimants is not shown by objective clinical and laboratory findings does not mean that HEW must give little weight to allegations thereof. So here's the court telling HEW, but also telling the physicians what constitutes compensable disability and why subjective pain and subjective complaints matter and should not be regarded in determining disability benefits. Now, if there's a public sector debate about pain and deservedness, there's also a private sector debate that you might also recognize given the political landscape today. And this is what it looks like. The, public, the private sector also has solutions to the rise of pain. And the solutions come in the form of drugs like Demerol. They come in the form of new drugs like Percodan, which you might recognize as ox it's oxycodone. This is where it comes from. It's not oxycodone, it's not the time release oxycodone, but it's oxycodone. In its earliest days, oxycodone is seen as the answer to the problem of morphine. The answer to the problem of the opioids. Why? Well, early clinical evidence in the 1950s suggested um, that it acts fast, it lasted long, and it provided thorough relief. Early physiological observations suggested that it was at least as good as morphine, but it doesn't produce respiratory depression. And there's a particular model of addiction at work here that says that addiction is based on the rapid metabolism and euphoria. And because this is drug is well tolerated and broken down extremely slowly, early theories suggested that there should be little euphoria and the addiction should not be a problem. On the basis of this, oxycodone is widely prescribed. It's not subject to the triplicate blank system that other drugs are. And this becomes a source of regulatory concern. The endo company, just like uh, the manufacturers of Oxycontin today, um, are sort of widely advertising and influencing medical prescription practices as well. And this is the context, this public sector debate and private sector debate that somebody like John Bonica enters medical practice in the 1950s. Pain is not an easy topic in the 1950s. It's fraught with controversy if you turn to the disability system. It's fraught with controversy if you turn to the drug, uh, the pharmacological approaches. And it's also driven, I should mention, by end-of-life pain uh, is really the preserve, by and large, of neurosurgeons. And you have debates about the use of lobotomies and cardotomies in the treatment of chronic end-of-life pain. That is to say that removing what um, surgeons called the worry center of the brain was an effective way of treating a person who was dying with cancer. They had pain, but they simply didn't complain about it as much. And, as one surgeon said, they don't ask for morphine. This gives you a sense of the fraught political context that shapes medical decision-making in this time period. Out in California, the Attorney General is calling for scrutiny of the Endo Company, which he argues has waged a high-profile, high-powered campaign <coughs> among doctors and pharmacists. He bemoans the drug company's apparent influence on the California Medical Association, which has said this is not a dangerous drug and should not be re re returned to triplicate blank. 
in the context of California, there are people like Edward Bloomquist, a member of the Committee on Dangerous Drugs at the California Medical Association, who, who you might say, it's, this is a kind of a reflection of where we stand today in, in some ways. He is concerned about Percodan marketing and addiction. He sees, as we do today, the connections between oxycodone and heroin, although this is how he describes this. He says the drug has acquired the identifiable status of being the principal substitute choice as a substitute for heroin. So whereas, whereas today we talk about Oxycontin leading to heroin, what they're anxious about is heroin users moving towards Percodan in this time period. And then he makes this observation about California, which is both humorous but also historically accurate. It may seem odd that California has become a center for Percodan misuse. Two factors contribute to this. California, he says, has an undue share of unstable personalities <laughs> who welcome bizarre methods of escaping reality. I mean, this is, after all, California in the early 1960s. He knows what he is talking about, right? The 60s is about to begin, and drugs are certainly at the center of that transformation. It's a social portrait of California in changing times, but it's also leading Congress, the Senate, to look closely at Percodan. So it, in some ways, this. It seems like we might be coming full circle here in the debate about oxycodone, uh, heroin, and opiates. This is the context that makes pain fraught politically and clinically in the 1950s. But the times are changing, and they're moving towards liberal and liberating trends in pain medicine and the recognition of pain as a subjective and important topic. And one of the driving forces is a new theory of pain that emerges in the early 1960s. It's the brainchild of two scientists who are not attached to clinical medicine. They're not surgeons. They're not coming out of the world of pharmacology. And they're not like Henry Albronda, anesthesiologists. They're, they're people like Ronald Melzack, a psychologist, and Patrick Wall, a physiologist. Uh, and they are the architects of a new theory called the gate control theory of pain, which highlights the importance of subjective pain as real. They argue against a, a concrete kind of anatomical surgical idea of pain. In 1962, they say the concept of there being a pain center in the brain is totally inadequate to account for the sequence of behavior and experience. They argue, indeed, the concept is pure fiction. The thalamus, the limbic system, the hypothalamus, the pyramid cortex, and the frontal cortex are all impl implicated in pain perception. But more importantly, they argue that our approaches are the function of a historical accident, simply because psychiatry, pharmacology, and surgery were dominant disciplines in medicine after World War II does not mean that that's what pain is. Pain is not simply a victim of which medical specialties happen to be controlling the debate. They say the pharmacological theory is too narrow. Pain is just more than stimulus nerves spinal cords and brain. Pain, they argue, and it may seem make sense that as a psychologist and a physiologist they might argue this, but pain is psychological, it's neurophysiological, it's past history, it's context. The context in which one experiences pain determines one's perception, and it's personality traits. All of these shape pain perception. Looking back from the 1970s, Ronald Melzack, and here he is in a, um, he's a Canadian uh, scientist and it's a Canadian broadcast of the puzzle of pain. He says, gate control theory, this idea that, you know, there's this electric, complex set of electrical gates that can be opened and closed to transmit pain, but what, what, what shapes the opening and closing of those gates can be multiple in nature. Gate control theory wrote in, he said, on a zeitgeist, and he himself was as astonished by its acceptance. But one of the things that gate control theory did, if you believe in gate control theory, it meant that you should experiment. You should think broadly about approaches to pain care. You should try relaxants. You should try tranquilizers. You should try things that aren't analgesic nerve block. You could try sedatives. You could try suggestion, placebo, hypnosis. All of them were known to influence pain perception, and all of them should be embraced. So you could say there's a kind of a liberalization of approaches to pain that deserve more attention than they have received. And other indices of the liberalization of pain are the endorsement and a belief that everybody's pain is just not just individualized, but subjective pain maybe has cultural features. There's a book that comes out in 1969 called People in Pain, written by an anthropologist named Mark Zabrowski. It's based on a study in the VA hospital. Looked in back, in, <clears throat> looked back in hindsight, this is either 
the emergence of what you might call cultural awareness in pain, different ethnic groups experience and talk about pain differently, or the crudest form of ethnic stereotyping you can imagine. In fact, it's both. He says, Jews, they're vocal, they're highly suspicious of doctors, they're concerned, and they're always complaining about pain. Italians are also vocal, but they tend to be trusting, and he argues that they're present-oriented, as in if the pain is present, they complain, but if the pain has just passed, it's as if it doesn't happen. The Irish, he says, are actually a particular problem because they tend to ignore pain, as if it doesn't exist, as well as being highly suspicious of doctors. It's a cruel combination. You don't talk about your pain, you ignore it. It's a kind of pathological stoicism. And it won't surprise you that the old Americans or Anglo-Americans that he interviewed in these healthcare settings are considered to be the ideal pain patients. They rationalize pain. They talk about pain in a language that their physicians, who are also Anglo-Americans, understand. So he was giving rise, highlighting the kind of cultural complexity of pain as it manifested itself in everyday clinical encounters. But the idea here is that culture and subjectivity mattered. You have other indices of the rise of subjective pain as real pain. For instance, <coughs> the emergence of the multidisciplinary pain clinic has become a, a new modality, a new, a new mode building on what people like John Bonica has done. Other people have written about the invention of pain medicine, the rise of the patient, um, that this system. You also have the development of things that we know and love or despise, depending on your perspective. The pain questionnaire. Um, or, before I get to the pain questionnaire, patient-controlled analgesia, which is developed in four different settings around the world around the same time period. The argument here being, Rather than debating about whether a person's pain is real or not, or how severe it is and how it should be relieved, put a morphine drip in their hand in a controlled setting and let them decide. This is an aspect of that liberalization of pain around the idea that subjective pain is real and let the patient decide what relief is required. And then there's the pain questionnaire. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever had, how would you describe your pain today? It comes out of this time period. It's the late 60s, early 1970s, really, the McGill pain questionnaire emerges, also the brainchild of Ronald Melzack. You might say pain is liberal, becoming liberalized, and one of the debates is, you know, how far is this going to go in the course of the 1970s? Um, there's some advocates that argue that, you know, having passed the Controlled Substances Act, that has shunned LSD, marijuana, and heroin from any form of legitimate medical research, let alone medical practice, we need to revisit that ban. And there are <coughs> some who argue that we need to rethink concerns about these substances for the treatment of terminally ill cancer patients. It's interesting that marijuana has come back into that debate, LSD and heroin not so much. But it shows you the kind of influence of liberal politics in the 1970s that is asking these questions. There are also global developments that are shaping pain care. Um, this may seem like a reach, but you'll see that it's not. Richard Nixon, uh, staunch anti-communist, uh, engages in the surprising detente with Chairman Mao in 1972. And in the US press, it says, nothing in the American rediscovery of China has excited the popular imagination more than acupuncture and anesthesia. Pictured here in the Los Angeles Times. The question is, does it work? According to whom? Um, the gate control theory says the nerve signals the body uh, can be gated. It's believed that stimulation produced by the acupuncture needles causes the gates to close, thus preventing pain impulses, but we're not sure why it works. What role should acupuncture have in healthcare? Asked in the early 1970s what explains the growth of pain medicine as a field, John Bonica himself says, undoubtedly one of the major revolutions in our concept of pain in the last hundred years has been this gate control theory. The field of pain research, which had stagnated for almost a century, has recently been reborn. Asked by the US News and Roll Report in 1974, Dr. Bonica, what is pain? And can science actually define the sensation, he says, if you asked 100 different authorities that question, you would get 100 different answers. You might say this is an example of the rise of subjective pain as real pain, the idea that what works for you might not work for you, 
that we, as a society we need to encourage multiple approaches to what pain is and how it should be relieved, whether it's transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or suggest acupuncture or patient-controlled analgesia in other settings. Right? These are hallmarks of what I call a kind of liberalization in pain, the arrival of pain as a legitimate area of clinical investigation, but it's also becoming increasingly diffuse. Um, I could say a lot more about the controversy surrounding those developments. Uh, one of the things that happens in the wake of this, for instance, is that um, John Bonica actually goes to uh, China and he begins to document acupuncture because he feels he's being besieged by state legislatures and practitioners asking him, what do you as the leader in the pain field think about this acupuncture? So it's creating all kinds of controversies in anesthesiology as well. In the public sector, there's also controversy. And so I, I'm only going to be able to skip through this really kind of quickly. But you might say, if liberal times produce a liberal endorsement of subjective pain, chronic pain as real pain, and an embrace of social policies that create compassionate opportunities for people in chronic pain, it wouldn't surprise you to learn that a conservative turn in American politics produces skepticism about those liberal policies. Writing in 1984, uh, one health policy scholar writes, over the past 20 years, a significant number of federal cases of disability were decided on in which the alleged disability was wholly or substantially related to pain. You might say the liberal trends of the 60s and 70s in the, had produced a set of policies, both in the clinic and also in public policy, in the name of relief, compassion, social justice, the recognition of individuality, subjective pain being real pain, and the value of intersubjective understanding. That is to say, I don't know how much pain you really are in, but I'm going to trust that what you say has some legitimacy and some plausibility. But underpinning those, even in the age of Henry Albronda, there was concern, and you might call it conservative concern. This impulse is always there. Concern about the social consequences of indulging subjective pain. As a parent, you deal with it, right? When your kid falls down, do you rush over and pick him up? Or do you say, you know, just ignore him, cry, he'll cry it off, and you... I mean, all of these kinds of issues, which for parents and practitioners are real and every day, are also playing themselves in public policy. Are you feeding addiction by providing quick avenues of drug relief? Are you creating dependency, malingering, or what becomes known not as malingering, but as learned helplessness? And what are the costs of creating a system that is indulgent in this particular way? So when I was doing research, one of the places that I went in trying to understand the politics of pain is I went to the Reagan archives in Loma Linda. I opened up a box uh, of his Office of Policy Development to try to figure out what they were doing about Social Security disability policy, that issue of disability that had been such a centerpiece of debate in the 1950s for Eisenhower. What does this look like with the rise of a new conservative era in American government? And I come across a memo like this by one of the people who works in the White House, Peter Ferrara, who says this. <coughs> Over the years, the disability benefit provision were significantly over-liberalized as compared with the original concept of paying some benefits only for truly permanent and total disability. The administration's proposal would change back the definition of disability so that it would rest solely on medical grounds. It would not take into account vague factors which are so difficult to determine in a consistent manner. The debate about the role of objectivity and subjectivity in pain determination really was one part of a broader debate about how you determine who has access to disability benefits or not. This is not a debate that Reagan started. This had already begun in the 1970s, where you have the Page v. Celebrezzi case from 1963 that says subjective pain is real pain. Already by the 1970s, you have rulings that say, where judges are determining that pain is not easily diagnosed, but the secretary is not at the mercy of every claimant's subjective assertions of, 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 of pain when determining eligibility. And even in clinical medicine, the architects, the people who run pain centers like Stephen Brenna in Atlanta, 
in the 1970s, late 70s, is beginning to ask the question, are we doing patients good, or are we doing them, are we doing badly by them, or for them, by building chronic pain centers? The way he puts it in a book called Chronic Pain, and this will show you the signs of a changing times, he expresses a new ideology. He writes about what he calls the learned pain syndrome. He says, chronic pain is often a conditioned socioeconomic disease. He says the majority of patients that in his clinic show pain behavior in excess of biomedical findings, and that society had gone too far in granting monetary compensation for escape from work via pain complaints. There is a relationship between the changing political conversation and this changing clinical conversation about who's in pain and what degree of relief they deserve. And many see the connection. So uh, Charles Morris writes in the LA Times, disability benefits have ballooned tenfold in 20 years to close to 15 billion. Growth had particularly rapid in mental disabilities, addictions, and subjective states like intense back pain. Reagan, he said, attempted to impose rigorous new disability tests on the assumption that many of the so-called disabled were malingerers. And on the basis of this, in the, from the period from 1981 to 1985, about half a million people were removed from the disability roles, many of whom were claiming pain as the source of their disability. <coughs> Excuse me. It became known as the purging of the roles by the 1984-85. And not surprisingly, where did these cases end up? They didn't end up in doctor's offices, they ended up in the courts. And ultimately, once again, it was the courts that were asked to decide what level of pain is real pain, and what level of relief do people in pain deserve. Let me just uh, move towards conclusion with a couple of observations. Uh, this became the subject of a 1987 Institute of Medicine report, which pointed out that the purging of roles had produced years of litigation and appeals. Another landmark case uh, settled in 1984 was the case of Pulaski v. Heckler, Heckler being the, 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 the Secretary of Health and, uh, Health and Human Services under Reagan, where once again you see the courts, not physicians, setting guidelines for how you judge pain. And here you see in the settlement a complex attempt to thread the needle between society's conservative commitments to people in pain and liberal commitments to people in pain and conservative anxieties. It says, while the claimant has the burden to prove that the disability results from a medically determinable physical and mental impairment, direct medical evidence of the cause and effect relationship between the impairment and the degree of the claimant's subjective complaints need not be produced. The adjudicator may not disregard a complainant's uh, subjective complaints solely because the objective medical findings evidence does not fully support them. This is an effort to say, you know, how and under what circumstances you treat subjective pain as real, what level of objective evidence is needed, whether you should outright dismiss subjective evidence, no, what role should it play in disability determination. These issues have not disappeared. They kind of rise and fall. All of these questions, the role of drugs, the role of uh, pharmacology in dealing with our pain problems, the role of public sector uh, ways of dealing with pain have not disappeared. But they change with the political times. In 1986, the concern was the fact that we live in a society, and that this is still true today, where we have two different kinds of pain problems. We have undertreatment, that is to say, in the face of skepticism and anxiety about addiction and dependence and malingering and creating problems to answer the problems of pain, we are undertreating people. And we simultaneously have the problem of overmedication. The problem in our society and public policy is we tend to treat only one problem at the time. We kind of swing like a pendulum, thinking that undertreatment is the problem, and then overtreatment is the problem, and then undertreatment is the problem. But we never could grapple with the fact that these two issues could coexist at the same time. And their origins can sometimes be in the clinic, but also in society. So at the same time we have the overuse of opiates, we have studies that show racial and ethnic disparities in access to analgesics in, in ER settings. How can these two things coexist? The politics of pain changes. Right around the time that John Bonica comes to the end of his life in 1994, 
in the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, a new debate emerges. The state of Oregon has passed a physician-assisted suicide law, and this engages a new political backlash. Uh, religious right uh, individuals, uh, congressmen like Henry Hyde, proposed the Pain Relief Promotion Act of 1994 to answer what's been going on in Oregon. Concerned that physician-assisted suicide might become more prevalent, they proposed permit permitting the DEA to prosecute physicians who dispense controlled substances for the purposes of hastening death. That is to say, we're some want a society that's more liberal with regard to end-of-life pain care. Others want a society that threatens physicians and says, if you do anything that even simulates end-of-life physician-assisted suicide, you will be uh, you you may be prosecuted. So the politics of pain changes once the physicians of suicide law. States are drawn into this debate, writing new guidelines, a new tide of new pain laws, regulations, and guidelines emerge in states trying to shape how doctors and other practitioners navigate this new political terrain. <coughs> and there are other fracture lines. On the right, you know, when asked what pains matter in society, somebody like Henry Hyde, in the wake of the rise of the religious right, begin to talk about a pain that there's very little scientific evidence for, but there's a lot of political evidence for, um, fetal pain. And you have a kind of a rallying around, in the name of really stopping abortion rights developments, the idea that fetal, the pain of the fetus is the pain we should be rallying around. And on the left, you might say, there are those who rally around pain at the end of life. The irony, of course, is that these are kind of the two extreme places of birth, pre-birth, and death. Who's left out? The person in chronic pain. Right? It shows you how, in the chapter four, I write about the divided states of analgesia. That we have states that are passing medical marijuana laws or passing end-of-life pain laws, and others that are really writing regulations about fetal pain. But what's lost sight of is the fact that people live in chronic pain and they need uh, a way to guide their way through. When I write about the politics, this is actually from Science Magazine that did a, a review of my book, and this is the picture that they put um, to adorn the review. That is to say, you know, pain as a fractious topic in American politics today. When these debates about end-of-life pain emerge, they, like all the other debates about pain, end up in court. In the case of Washington v. Glucksburg, which is decided by the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court is asked whether people have a right to die, and they decide no. But do you have a right to palliative care? And the Supreme Court comes about as close as you can to, eval to validating that. And in some ways, they're, they're informed by another theory of pain that's promoted by the American Medical Association. The American Medical Association files a brief that rejects physician assisted suicide, but supports what it calls the principle of double effect. That is the recognition that physicians should provide patients pain medication sufficient to ease their pain, even when that may hasten death. They say that this is vital to ensuring that no patient suffer from physical pain. Once again, threading the political line between what the liberals and the conservatives are anxious and concerned about. And Justice O'Connor, Sandra Day O'Connor, appointed by Reagan, but was the classic swing justice in many issues, writes what many regard to be an important opinion on this. And she says, there is no dispute that dying patients in Washington New York can obtain palliative care, even when doing so would hasten their death. This is the Supreme Court speaking on how we should navigate this question in the politics of pain medicine. Well, after the Supreme Court speaks, Henry Hyde isn't done, and he comes across, he comes up with the promotion, Pain Relief Promotion Act, which, is, which says we need something harsher to threaten physicians who engage in what we regard as uh, physician suicide. The name of his legislation is Pain Relief Promotion Act, and Marsha Angel, writing for the New England Journal of Medicine, says the title is misleading. If the bill becomes law, it will almost certainly discourage doctors from prescribing and administering adequate doses. So I'm going to end by just making a couple of comments. I mean, so pain is not just controversial in medicine and society because of opiates. That's an important issue. But if you look at the long history, we have a deep abiding moral and cultural debate that's been continuing to unfold. It's 
70 years, this is what I do in the book, 70 years of cultural debate and social transformation. Some of it hinges on that fundamental question of measurement and the role of objectivity and subjectivity all mixed with ideology about when pain matters and when it doesn't. There's this underlying debate about dependence, dependency. Not just like welfare dependency and dependency on government programs, but dependency on drugs. And to what extent dependency and disability and addiction are the problem that we're trying to attack, or are we trying to attack pain? And we move back and forth, never really settling anywhere in that particular debate. And then there's a debate about whose pain matters. Some of us think that certain pains are more credible and worthy of relief than others. And not surprisingly, when you scratch the surface, there's political commitments underpinning those ideas about whose pain matters. And finally, there's the fact that people in chronic pain are victims, not just of their pain, but of this highly politicized debate. And what my book is trying to do is to sort of shine a light on the calculations that have really made their pursuit of relief fraught. And part of what I'm trying to highlight here is that for that doctor standing over the patient's bedside, trying to decide on where the line is between compassionate relief and the production of pleasure and drug dependency, he or she might not explicitly acknowledge it. But all of these political calculations, all of these anxieties that are part of our political debate are swirling around him and her in that room as they decide, and they try to decide what level of relief that individual patient deserves. And the point of my book is to try to bring some of that out into the open and contribute to what the IOM uh, asked for in a recent study on pain, which is that we need not just better drugs and better approaches, but we need a cultural transformation in the way pain is viewed and treated. And writing a political history of pain has been my effort to encourage and shape that cultural debate. So I'll end there. I think there are about eight minutes left, and I'm happy to uh, have a conversation with you. Okay, that's a rich and fast tour through the land of pain and the politics of pain. And we do have time to take your questions and comments. Um, when you have the microphone, please um, identify yourself before you ask your question or raise your comment. Uh, Bob Chevalier, Department of Pediatrics at UVA. You spoke uh, really pretty much wholly on American politics. What about Europe and Asia, other cultures? How do they compare? So, uh, I, but I'm, I'm what's called in the history field a narrow Americanist. I uh, feel guilty to that. But you do see uh, trends uh, moving across national boundaries. Um, I skipped very quickly over the book by Isabel Basinger, which is about inventing pain medicine in France and in the US. And what she finds is a, a, a greater appreciation of the role of medical expertise in pain debates. And less of a kind of, there's a, there's a disability debate, but there's less of a sort of a moralistic debate in France over the course of time in the early days of pain medicine. In China, I skipped over this, when John Bonica goes to China, he takes off his hat as a clinician and he becomes something of an anthropologist. He's interested in the politics of pain in China. And he's able to see with a fascinating acuity that in the wake of the Maoist kind of cultural revolution, there's a political dynamic that's driving the embrace of acupuncture. That physicians will say to him on the side, you know, this is more of a political statement about China showing that it has ancient wisdom that can, as, that can be as good as anything the West has produced. And it's less about efficacious engagements with pain care in the clinical setting. They'll say that to him on the side, but in public, they speak in praise of acupuncture. So every culture, I would say, has its unique pain politics. Um, I can't, you know, I wrote a book that's really fundamentally about America, 
But you're right that you know there's much to be learned by looking elsewhere and seeing how those debates shape our own. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for the great talk. I'm Virginia <coughs> from the UVA School of Nursing. I'm curious as to your um, perspective on recent initiatives for opioid risk mitigation, um, right. prescription drug monitoring programs, prescribing naloxone along with opioids, that sort of thing. If you see those um, initiatives as sort of a positive step in this culture transformation, or um, how, how you would frame those? Great question. Um, so the last chapter of the book, which I didn't get to, is called OxyContin Unleashed. And I see the, it, it's really, it tells the story of the rise since the 1980s of the idea that better drugs are going to get us out of this problem of increasing levels of chronic pain. After all, we're a sedentary society. There's more pain associated with aging and the kind of lifestyles we lead. There's a, simultaneously this idea that better drugs, that walk the line between relief and dependency are going to get us out of this. A lot of that faith is driven by another byproduct of the Reagan and Clinton era, which is the de deregulation of the drug industry. And the idea that what we need is to push products out there and let the market determine what's successful and what's not successful. Um, what I track in the book is the rise of pain drugs, the peak of controversy surrounding them, and their disappearance. Before OxyContin, there was Vioxx. Before Vioxx, there was Toradol. I mean, really, it's been a wave of kind of market booms and market busts. Some of them have been really successful. But others, like Motrin, Motrin was actually the one that people wanted to emulate most. And it's still there and doing enormously successful work. But so in a way, the risk mitigation strategy is a strategy that's just trying to deal with the fact that we've created a, a pharmacologically intensive approach to drugs. And we've created a reimbursement system that privileges the quick fix pharmacological approach. So that model of pain care that John Bonica developed, I was giving a talk recently to a, a group of pain physicians, and they said, you know what happened to the multidisciplinary pain clinic? It was economically not viable. It, it cost too much. It costs too much to maintain. The quicker, easier way is to find the drug. And so we live, we, we have a problem, which is that we're, we're always looking for the drug that's going to solve the problem created by the last drug, and then that drug becomes a problem in itself. And to me, that's the problem of oxycodone. That's the problem of oxycodone. Time-release oxycodone was supposed to solve the problem that, that Percodan had. As a story, it's no surprise that it plays itself out that way. So I'm a skeptic of risk mitigation because it seems like it's solving a problem, only a, a, a small portion of what the problem is. Hi, my name is Claire. I'm an ICU nurse here at UVA. Um, we've been hearing a lot in the past couple weeks about the rising death rates among middle-aged whites. Yeah. And several people have proposed that that's due to chronic pain and opioid use. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how much credence you give to that theory and well, how you think that might influence the politics of pain going forward. That's a great question, partly because you know the, the architects of that study, Angus Deaton and Ann Case, are my colleagues at Princeton. And I've been talking with them about their findings for the longest time. And I think what they've identified is a trend, but I think that there, the evidence for it, you know, laying it at the feet of opioid addiction, I, I'm not sure that the data is robust enough to suggest that. Um, but you know, it's a good example of the fact that if you have a set of anxieties that are pre-existing that are out there, and then you have a, a, a set of findings, the two find each other. And our policies often emerge in their, in their wake, whether our anxieties are about disability or about premature death uh, by you know, middle-aged uh, white Americans. So I don't know that the data can substantiate one policy or another. Uh, and this is a debate that I have. I've had with Angus for a long time, but now he's a Nobel Prize laureate, so you know, I guess you know, he's going to win that debate. I don't know how it's going to play itself out. Okay, do we have maybe one more question? Thanks.
I'm Brian. I'm a pharmacist at the hospital. I wanted to get back to an uh, answer you just had to a question and maybe dig a little deeper. So one of the big things in pain is multimodal therapy, using more uh, other or multiple drugs instead of only opioids. And so I'm interested in how you think that opioids specifically and their um, the dependence and addiction specifically relate to the political aspect. So if we were to perhaps use more drugs, use fewer opioids, how that would perhaps decrease some of the political aspects related to what you discussed in your talk. Thank you. Um, that's a really terrific question, and I'm not sure I have the um, I'm not sure I, I have the, the standing to actually delve that deeply into the question of whether if we solved or orchestrated better approaches to opioid using opioids in clinical situations, whether that would be enough to mitigate some of this political tension. Um, many of the controversies surrounding um, pain medicines like Vioxx and Celebrex were not because they were opioids. It's because we're grappling with the trade-off between a drug that allows an elderly person with arthritis to have a satisfying life to engage in outdoor activity and the trade-offs of increasing risks of various forms of heart disease. And as a society, the FDA has to grapple with that, an individual clinician has to deal with that, an individual patient has to deal with this, and ultimately, the drug companies have to decide on whether the risk, the, the benefits in profits, and the liability based on the side effects of the drugs are things that they want to tolerate. Merck decided Vioxx, not worth it, but we still have Celebrex. That, those are debates that are independent of opioids, right, and opiates. That is to say, so part of the issue in, that, that confounds the question of opiates, yes, it segues into a wide debate about dependency and about the unintended effects of various forms of narcotic use. But it's one version of a set of debates that we have about drugs and how we weigh risks and benefits at the clinical level, at the patient level, and as a matter of public policy. So even if we figured out the opiates, I don't think these issues would go away. Well, it pains me to say that we're out of time. I'm right. so sorry. This is a very rich conversation. And if some of you have some questions uh, still lingering, please please come down and talk with Keith Wei Lu. Um, we hope that you can join us next week for a program called Couch Meets Scanner, the new science of neuropsychoanalysis. And this is another program that brings the past into new focus um, because of the findings of present science and, and present culture. Uh, that program will actually be in the medical education auditorium in the Claude Moore Medical Education Building across the street because this auditorium was unavailable. So we will see you then. And in the meantime, please join me in thanking Keith Wayloo.